Okay. Uh, we are live. Uh, hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, we are today going to do part two uh, of our study on Adam and Eve. So um, if you didn't see part one, it's available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. You can go back and watch that. We're going to pick up where we left off last time. But uh, first, uh, I'd like for the panelists to introduce themselves. Just uh, each panelist, take a moment to tell the world who you are and uh, what your ministry is, is about. And I hope that all the viewers will subscribe to these uh, panelists. Let's start with Brother Bill. Yep, hello, I am Bill. I'm the Panda Man Evangelist. And you tell by my name that I like to evangelize. You know, I try and keep the the gospel as simple as I possibly can and obviously as truthful as possible you know because a gospel without truth has no power whatsoever so yeah that, you know that, that is what I do here on YouTube that's what I do on Facebook and that's what I do you know when I hit the streets and the towns just preaching the, the simple glorious gospel of Christ all right Thank you, Brother Bill. Brother Brother Dean, your turn. Hi, Dean here. Uh, my YouTube channel is Virtual at 12. Um, it's just really a channel, just doing videos with the Bible and stuff like that, and sharing the good news as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Dean. And uh, Brother Jason. Luke, praise the Lord, up here in... Cleveland, Ohio right now while my Cavs are playing the Oklahoma City Thunder during our <laughs> get-together right now. Thanks to Luke Boozer, actually. I'm the author of the first book that he kind of uh, inspired me to get published. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, it's called Power in Your Weakness. Jason Warner, W-E-R-N-E-R. -E -E my YouTube channel is Jason Warner. And a book uh, for which Luke Boozer wrote a preface is called I Set You Free, came out in June of 2014, all about setting people free from lordship salvation. It's awesome. Thank you very much for your help with that, Luke. And um, it really explains how to understand the Bible in its proper context. For example, the Epistle of James, you know, Luke, people don't understand what happened in, in uh, the assassination attempt on, on Paul by, by uh, James, you know. And another book I wrote came out uh, in October, My Perfect Pregnancy, about doing a, a pain-free home birth. So I can see a little bit of idea of some things that I do, you know, obviously evangelism through books. I'm big into home births. It's really easy, no pain. It's fun, easy, simple. Thanks, bud. Okay, brother. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, Jason is a talented writer, so uh, you, I, I'm sure you uh, enjoy reading his books and may benefit from them also. Uh, okay, we're going to pick up now with this study of Adam and Eve, and uh, the brother Dean here. Uh, he's he is a, a what I would call maybe a, a muck raker, or a, a, he's all stirring up trouble. Uh, every time we we talk about a verse, he wants to ask us a question that's controversial, and it, but it makes us think. It makes us uh, search the scriptures and have an answer. So I'm grateful for the people who ask the questions, and especially hard questions. And uh, I have an answer to every question. Uh, it doesn't matter what your the theological question is. I have an answer. Sometimes the answer is. I, I'm sorry, I just don't know. <laughs> but but uh, if I know, I'll try to explain it, express it, uh, give you the answer as I see it. I may not always be right, but we have a panel of people here, so uh, the answer is uh, between among all of us, you know, perhaps we'll be able to answer the question satisfactorily. But sometimes we have to throw up our hands and say, uh, I don't understand every verse in the scriptures. And I'll be the first to admit that. So let's go right now. Uh, Brother Dean asked the question, 
when we read this verse, uh, and out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field. This is uh, Genesis, uh, let me see, uh, 1, no, this is Genesis 2, 19. And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Uh, out of the blue, Brother Dean, uh, at that point, said, uh, and that was, uh, these animals were provided for Adam and Eve as food so that they, they could eat meat. So I think that's a good question. Uh, let's take that on right off the bat here. Um, there are some verses that I have included that we can discuss in this, but first just let me get the panelists' just reaction to that. Uh, do you think at that point in time man was called to eat uh, uh, animal flesh, uh, Brother Bill? No, not initially, no. No, I don't, I don't think initially that, that, that mankind was to, was to eat meat. Obviously, after the fall, lots of things changed, you know, not only in, in a spiritual sense, but in a physical sense. You know, I, I think our, our bodies changed, and they obviously weren't, didn't have the longevity of a, an eternal physical life on Earth anymore. So, you know, something happened at the fall where our bodies could no longer just eat, you know, seeds and fruit, etc., and we had to have more sustenance. And I think it was at that point after, you know, God, you know, slew the first animals to, to clothe Adam and Eve, that it was probably at that point that we, we, we did start eating meat. That's what I would personally think. All right. Okay, that's an interesting uh, theory. And uh, obviously that was, uh, that was the first death, wasn't it? There was no death until God slew an animal to provide the covering for Adam and Eve. Uh, and uh, Brother uh, Stephen, he, he suggested in a previous study that maybe God didn't sl slay an animal at that time. God just pulled out of thin air, just like he, Jesus pulled out of thin air the loaves and the fishes. Uh, Brother Stephen suggested that perhaps God didn't slay an animal. Uh, to provide a covering for Adam and Eve. Um, I, it doesn't say anywhere that God slew an animal. We, we basically assume that at that point he slew an animal and provided the skin to cover Adam and Eve. And I personally like that because I think that's the first indication, a picture of things to come, that uh, Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves with the fig leaves. And that's a, that's a picture of man trying to uh, uh, solve the problem on his own through his own work. And God declared, well, that's not going to get the job done. I'm going to have to cover you. And God has to provide the covering. And it has to be a bloody sacrifice. Death must happen in order to provide this satisfactory covering. So to me, uh, it, it, uh, it's... Even though I can't prove it absolutely that God slew an animal, maybe he did just pull it out of thin air, as Brother Stephen suggested. Let's ask, uh, first, uh, let's ask Sister Joanne to introduce herself, now that she's here with us, and see if she wants to say anything about that. Hello, Sister. Help if I turn this on, hey. Hi, how are you all? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, we're, 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 we're all blessed, and we're just happy that you're here. So um, why don't you just uh, to tell the world about your YouTube channel for a second, and then if you want to answer, uh, if you need a little time to get acquainted with what we're talking about, that's fine. But if you have anything to say about my last statement, go ahead and say that. Um, no, not at the moment. I'm just trying to sort of get where you all are at. Okay. Uh, right now we're on, uh, the question is on Genesis 2.19, when God uh, had Adam name the, Adam, the animals, 
Um, Brother Dean brought up at this point that these animals were provided for man's food. Uh, I want to read a couple of verses and get your, everybody's reaction to it. Let's look at first uh, uh, Genesis 1 29 and 30. I'll read that now. It says, Then God said, quote, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. Say, and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. Uh, okay, there's two statements here, two verses. And uh, the first verse is very clear that God says the, these plant life is for Adam and Eve's food. And then the second one, uh, I'd like uh, someone to comment on that. Uh, whoever raises their hand I'll, I can go first. Whoever wants to make a comment. All right, then I will explain it myself. Uh, <laughs> Here's the, some people would misunderstand in, in verse uh, 20, uh, 30, it says, and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, well, a person could get confused in that verse and think that uh, uh, God is saying, in addition to the fruit, Adam and Eve, I'm also giving you the beasts of the earth and the birds of the air for food. But that's not what the verse is saying. For God is saying in verse 29, Adam and Eve, I'm giving you all the plants to eat. And, and a beast, all the beasts and birds, he's talking to the beasts and birds right there. He's saying, all, all you beasts and birds, uh, uh, I'm also giving you, if, if you breathe, if you have life and you're breathing, then I'm giving you all the plant life for your food. So here in Genesis 1, 29 and 30, God is declaring, not only is man, but, but all living uh, animal life is supposed to eat plant life. That's what it says in Genesis 1, 29, and 30. And of course, this is before the fall, isn't it? Okay, so let me ask, uh, it, it, by the way, since uh, everybody's a little bit uh, hesitant about speaking, uh, if you or anxious to say something, just raise your hand or wave your hand or something, and I'll, and I'll call on you. Otherwise, I will select someone. In this case, I'm going to ask Brother Bill if he can, he can uh, discuss those two verses. Well, yeah, that, 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 that's the point I made earlier, and I'm in agreement with that, that, that God initially gave, you know, all the, you know, the seeds and the plants and the herbs for man to eat, which is verse 29, then verse 30, he gave same to the creatures to eat the same plants, herbs, you know, and vegetation. So we can see clearly before this is obviously before the fall. So you know, biologically, our bodies were, were made up, and so were all the creatures' bodies, you know, were made in such a way that they, they could be sustained by just literally eating seeds, herbs, and vegetation. You know, and this obviously before the fall. So, you know, I'm, I'm in agreement there. You know, to me, it, it speaks clearly, the, the verses. Uh, okay, I have a question for anybody who dares to answer it. And that is that uh, um, if, if, if Brother Dean is correct and animal life would be eaten before the fall, where is the problem with that line of thinking? Or where, what, what serious problem is created there? Yeah, go ahead. Brother, brother. <laughs> yeah, no, I was going to ask, sorry. Well, well, the problem is that before the fall there was no death, you know, because sin came and so death entered in. So if, if, if we had to, you know, eat creatures, they'd have to die, which would then assume that sin was in the world before the fall. So to me, it's a, it's a non-starter. You know, death came in through sin, so nothing, you know, nothing died, you know, creature-wise. You know, so, you know, we didn't eat each other, you know, 
Flesh didn't eat flesh. Uh, yeah, that's correct. And uh, you said that uh, the way you phrased it was think different than what I was thinking. Is that the problem there is that this would mean that death entered the world before sin entered the world. And that this is this is the problem that uh, uh, we have when we have a, a Christian who believes in some like Darwinian evolution, or which is uh, let's say um, intelligent design, where God used an evolutionary process to create. The problem with that is that you would have death for a long time before Adam and Eve ever committed a sin. And so uh, that, that really destroys the, the whole basic concept of Christianity is that uh, uh, man fell because of the sin and we needed to be redeemed. Uh, so uh, this is very important to understand. Uh, I'm going to move and read another verse, and whoever is anxious to comment on it, just get my attention. Uh, I'm going to look now, Genesis 9, verses 1 through 5. Um, then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, quote, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, upon every creature that moves along the ground, and upon all the fish of the sea, they are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. All right, so we have two things that I've put forth here. The first verse we discussed is much earlier in history, before the fall, and God's saying that he's giving plant life for animal life. Animal life will live on plant life. Not just Adam and Eve and mankind, but, but all animal life should eat plant life. And then we have another, we're way ahead now in Noah's time. And uh, now God's declaring that in addition to the plant life, I'm giving you, Noah, and mankind, I'm giving you animal life as a source of food. So to me, this is clearly tells us that uh, in the beginning, man was uh, herbivorous. We did we did not eat uh, animals. We were not carnivorous or omnivorous, where you ate both. Uh, but um, and then with Adam, with in Noah's time, what was the reason? Uh, is there? I don't think there's any reason given. We have to surmise it. Okay, so can, does anybody have anything to say about these two verses? Does that prove anything to us? Okay, yeah, Brother Jason. Yeah, it's interesting we bring this up now, Luke, this 9, 1 through 5 in Genesis, after we look at the first and second chapters of Genesis. If God all of a sudden is bringing us, you know, with regard to this issue of Noah and after the flood and all that stuff, if he's going to bring us right back, and, and use the argument that, hey, you know what, just as I gave you the fruit of the ground and the, the herbs, I'm going to allow you to have animals. It's almost as though it sounds like, hey, this whole slaughtering of animals thing to eat them back before this fall thing and sin, it doesn't matter, it almost seems. You know what I'm saying? Uh, the, the the final point you made, I didn't see how that was connected to what you you had earlier said. Uh, um, are you you're saying that it doesn't matter if man uh, was was eating animals before the fall? Yeah, you know, it almost seems as though when God seems to be starting over with Noah, say, hey, look, you can go ahead, and whatever whatever you you want to eat, go with it. If, if he's going to start all over again, you'd think he'd start afresh and do things the way he did in the beginning. I was, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to start all over and change everything again, but this whole animal thing back when I said you couldn't eat them, and you couldn't you know, eat this for food, no, no, we can't do it back then, but we can do it now. It just wouldn't seem right. That's why I'm saying it seems as though if he's going to do it now, he's, he probably allowed it back then, and it wasn't. It must not have been an issue with regard to sin and, and the fall and all that stuff.
But hey, look, I'm an American. I like to eat meat, you know, so I'm going to be very biased, right? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I'm so, I was trying to talk and I forgot to unmute myself there, but I was saying that, uh, okay, I understand your, your, your viewpoint on that. Uh, and I, I think it's um, flawed. I don't agree with it. Uh, but uh, what is the difference if, if, if we take Jason's uh, question or, or point that, okay, in, in the beginning it was, uh, uh, we saw how it was in the beginning, and then we saw how it was with Noah. So therefore, in the beginning, uh, you know, there, why wouldn't, couldn't they have eaten animals before the fall? Uh, what is the problem with that? We, anybody want to take that on? What's the difference between between uh, those two times that, that, that kind of disqualifies his his theory? Well, I would say again is that that there was no death and to sin came, you know, came into the world. So the fall brought death. And then obviously, you know, lots of things also happened, you know, during the flood. You know, the, the, the canopy, you know, the, the, you know the, which was above the earth, you know, was broken and it rained for the first time. You know, the waters from under the earth were, were poured out as well. That happened for the first time. And from that time onwards, we can see a, a gradual decrease in, in the longevity of people because of you know this perhaps this canopy protected us from UV rays. So there's you know obviously there's one aspect to it. Obviously our bodies had changed, that the, the earth had changed after the flood, and we needed to eat you know meat now to to, to sustain itself. But but the as you said that the, the general gist of it. Is that, that that sin brought death? If we was to eat animals before sin, then that is implying that death came before sin, and which then, by default, can imply, you know, a, a, a evolutionary a creation. So you know, you, you're you're on a slippery slope as soon as you say, oh, you could eat meat before, you know, that the, the fall of man. That's what I believe. Yeah, uh, when Dean uh, posed the question or made the point that, uh, that uh, that's why God made the animals was so that we'd be eating them uh, for food, uh, then I, it, it brought up much more of an issue than uh, he probably realized when he, he made that statement because it really threatens uh, all of the, the, the core uh, doctrine of Christianity, and that is that uh, man was created, everything was good, and then we fell, and, and because of the fall, uh, because of sin, death entered the world. And so we, we believe that there was no death before the fall. And therefore, if, if, if we were eating animals before the fall, death, there would have been death before the fall. And that contradicts one of the basic core uh, concepts uh, of, of Christianity and, and uh, our doctrine of salvation. Uh, now there's another verse here, so we, yeah, Brother Dean, go ahead. What I was going to say was, um, I agree with what Bill says, but if you think about it, if God knew Adam and Eve were going to take the fall anyway, we know have created them because he knew they were going to take the fall anyway, so we had to eat them afterwards. You muted, Luke. I'm sorry, uh, brother Dean. I think my connection is a little weak. Your it was a little broken up, uh, static. You as you spoke. Would, would you state your question again, please? What I said was, um, okay, God created the animals to be meat for Adam, right? No one. I agree with Bill. Said right, no death before the fall. But if God had prior knowledge of the, that the fall was going to happen anyway. We did not create animals for after it. Okay, I'm still I'm still not sure about the question, so I, I think I got it though. Uh, but uh, doesn't this doesn't this uh, kind of a question uh, fall under the 
the, the so many things that we have to ask a, 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 about why did it happen uh, if God knew it was going to happen? Is, is it fate? Is it destiny? Or um, is there a difference between God knowing something's going to happen and ordaining it to happen? I think you're saying God planned for man to eat food, eat the animals. He made the animals for man to eat. And what I'm saying is initially he didn't, that wasn't the plan. But did he know the plan was going to fall apart because of his omniscience and foreknowledge? Of course he knew it. He knew that man was going to fall. So, so does that mean that he ordained for man to fall? No. But he knew he was going to fall. But it's not that he ordained it or caused it or desired it. It's just that he knew that if he gave man free will, that man, he knew how it was going to play out. All right, I don't know if that was the question you you're asking, but does anybody wants, else want to add to that? There's one more verse on this food question that I want to go into, but uh, does anybody want to answer it further on what Dean said? I think, I think, oh, okay. can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, yeah I think, I think, because uh, there was obviously breaking up the sound between you and Dean. I think Dean uh, said his position is, is similar to our, what you said secondly, that, that God in his foresight knew that man was going to fall, so then made a lot of backup plans so he could eat animals, as opposed to, you know, preordaining uh, thingy. I just I weren't sure if you picked up on that. So I think he, he, he's agreed with, with, you know, the second scenario that was posed by you. Okay, uh, now I'm going to throw a little monkey wrench in here just to see that there's another way of looking at this too. Uh, let's look at a, this additional verse. Um, we're going to go to Genesis 3.21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. Uh, Genesis Oh, and that's not what I want to say. Genesis 4.4, 4, Abel, on his part, also brought off of the firstlings of his flock of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. So the significance of this offering that Cain and Abel gave to God, and of course we know that uh, God rejected Cain's offering, because it was a picture of work. He worked in the field. He, he, he uh, Abel uh, did all this labor and produced something, and he tried to give it to God, uh, showing, look what I've done. Look all the work I put into this uh, farming I've done. And uh, God didn't accept it. But God did accept uh, Abel's offering because it wasn't based upon his work, it was based upon a blood sacrifice that he provided. He provided a firstling of his flock and, and their fat portions. So it's clear that Abel gave God uh, an animal sacrifice. Cain gave God the works of his hands uh, as a farmer. And God said that uh, the works of, of Cain were not accepted but the blood sacrifice of Abel were accepted. But the, the important thing about this in our discussion now is the fact that here's a blood sacrifice. So some people could argue that at this point in time, if Abel was making a blood sacrifice, that at that time, uh, man had already started eating animal flesh. And this is before Noah. It's after the fall, but before Noah. So, uh, what is your take on that? Anybody have now? Okay. Any takers? If there's no takers, I'll take. <laughs> All right, yeah. Billy, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and, that, and that's why you know I said right earlier that it, it does say it doesn't directly say, but it does imply that, that because. Abel used the blood sacrifice of the lamb that, that obviously death had come into the world now and that, that, that perhaps that they, they may have started eating 
meet at that point. You know, by implication, you know, we can't 100% prove it. It's not until we go to, obviously, Genesis 9 that, that it's proven. But, you know, it does seem to imply that, you know, meat, meat was consumed then, perhaps. Yeah, okay. So basically, we've discussed three possibilities here. One is the possibility that Dean initially introduced, and that is that when God made the animals and Adam named the animals, that at that time, the animals was a food source for man. Uh, and uh, my conclusion, I, I think Brother Bill has uh, expressed an agreement with this, that this is that, that would destroy the, the, the whole concept of uh, death entering the world through sin. Um, so, so we believe that the animal death uh, and eating of animals had to occur after the fall. Uh, so you could conclude that it happened after the fall because, because Abel was making the animal sacrifice. But you could also conclude that maybe the animal sacrifice was made but, but the animal wasn't eaten because it was not until Noah's time where God actually declared that I gave you the, the, all the plant life to eat in the past, but now I'm also giving you animal life to eat in addition to it. That's the time where God made the declaration that we see in the scriptures. Uh, if we think that God uh, gave animals to people for people to eat be, before Noah, we have to surmise it based upon this idea that uh, the animal sacrifices were being made, and I'm not sure that's a, 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 a real... A uh, good thing to base our, make our conclusion. Okay, so I think we've covered the subject of eating animals, when, and all that. But I want any final remarks on that before we, we start moving on to other Adam and Eve scriptures. Anybody have anything to sum, sum this up here on this this part of the discussion? Okay. All right. Let me move on then. Uh, Okay. Now we're going to go to uh, read uh, uh, right where we left off, Genesis 2, and we're on verse 20. Uh, and Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found any help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. We'll stop there. There's quite a bit of stuff in those three verses there. Um, first question is, but for Adam, there was not found any help meet for him. Anybody? Well, God's obviously there saw, that as it through his creation, that that, that all, all the cattle and the fowl of the air and every every different, you know, all creatures had a had a partner, and poor old Adam didn't have a partner. So obviously, God felt. You know, felt for him and said, "Right now, I think you know, I'm paraphrasing all this. You know, I think that that, that Adam needs a, a friend. He needs a buddy. He needs a helper. So I think that's you know, that's that's what is described here. That, that God in His love and mercy sees, you know, man, obviously looking at all these creatures with partners and 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 could see his heart being desirous of, of you know, a partner himself. So God, you know, done so." Okay, uh, uh, I, I I agree with you. Uh, uh, obviously, God knew that in his foreknowledge, he, he knew that Adam couldn't be alone as a human being and that, that he wanted Adam to have a, a, a partner, a, a wife, and, and through that have offspring uh, and uh, all of us. God... This was not a surprise to God. God knew the future. He knew how it was going to all play out. Uh, but so Adam needed, the animals couldn't give Adam what he needed 
First of all, it was not the kind of relationship Adam needed. And second of all, he couldn't reproduce. Uh, so he provided Eve. Um, but I want to ask you about this term, help meet. Uh, but for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. Maybe we should look at that in another translation. That's Genesis 2.20. Let's see if we can find that in uh, other translations and see what it says. Uh, if anybody finds it before me, go ahead. And Luke, isn't this referring to Genesis God giving him animals? What? Do you think it's possible that this is referring to God saying this help me is to be animals? I mean, I've always heard it as a wife, but I wonder if it's possible that he's referring to the animals. Uh, uh, geez, I'm having a trouble with this mute button. <laughs> but uh, no, I don't think that's possible at all, brother. I think when you read it, it's clearly saying that. I'll read it again so you can see. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helpmeet for him. So this is clearly drawing a contrast and saying that these animals were not satisfactory to provide what he needed, this helpmeet. And uh, we know that okay, good. Eve we got that is out the way one that... Uh, now I want to find Genesis 2.20, and uh, let's look at another translation, so let's see, Genesis 2.20. Let me see. Okay. Uh, But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. That's NIV. Uh, NLT says, but still there was no helper just right for him. English Standard says, but for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. And on and on, it's, they're saying, making the same point, but phrasing it a little bit differently. Um, but what's, can you really think of something that you might find as a problem with this particular end of this verse in terms of how people, some people take it? I think, the, the, because we're talking obviously before the fall here, that there was a, an equilibrium, an equality between man and woman. You know, and one, you know, I've heard it, you know, described this way. You know, when, when God created woman out of man's rib, you know, it didn't create it from his toe, i.e. that the, the woman should be beneath him and underfoot, and it didn't take it from any bones of his head so the woman could be above the man, but took it, you know, directly central so the woman, you know, was equal with the man. And, and a helpmate is literally... A helper, one who comes alongside who helps. So it, it was before the fall. It was an equality. You know, bone more bone, flesh and more flesh. All right. Um, I, I I think you made a good point about the rib, the location of the rib, uh, and uh, uh, but this this idea of being a help meet. Uh, or a helper for Adam. A helper is like a, another word for that would be a, a servant and, and, and a subordinate. Uh, and there's another verse that I found that uh, is kind of a, a cousin verse to this. And it's, uh, I don't know where it is, but it says, uh, uh, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. And uh, I think I made a video as. Husbands, submit yourself to your wives, uh, making the point that uh, Jesus not only, uh, the scripture not only say, wives, submit to your husbands, 
but a couple of verses before that it says submit yourselves one to another Ephesians 5 yeah okay thank you and, and so and Jesus washed the feet of the apostles as an example that to show us that if you want to be great the apostles were said well, who can which of us can be the greatest and he washed their feet and said if you want to be great this is what I, you should do uh, uh, lower yourself to the position of a servant and then I'll consider you great uh, so uh, I don't think Jesus was talking about only wives submitting to their husbands but husbands submitting to the wives and husbands submitting to each other all people uh, all believers serving all others uh, but I think this verse being a, a help meet and wives submit to your husbands are verses that I've seen misused uh, I've seen a lot of abuse to I've, I've, I've associated with some people that are uh, some of these street preachers I know that have really taken this uh, lording it over their wives one person in particular he he once uh, told me he was actually requiring his wife to call him Lord because Sarah called Abraham Lord he expected his wife to call him Lord and the way he talked to her he treated her like a dog and I had to I lectured him over that but uh, these are the kinds of verses that some people latch on to and, and misuse uh, so that's why I thought to me when it says made a help meet uh, we want to understand as brother Bill said uh, it wasn't intended that Adam and Eve would not be equal it says even in the the conclusion of all this as it's all played out and we get to the, the epistles at one point Paul says that there there is no difference Jew and Gentile male and female we're equal all right some people might uh, I've been and criticized for saying such a thing in the past uh, that uh, so uh, what's your reaction to that anybody is Joanne's thing frozen it looks I haven't seen her picture move at all for uh, is your jo Joanne can you communicate with us because uh, it looks like your video is on a freeze I think she's just sent the message saying that she's having problems you know, with a speaker and stuff. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. So, uh, and nobody seems to be as concerned about that as me, I guess. So. Well, I'll no, actually, you, you, you really, you really hit on a good point there, Luke. Uh, marriage is not supposed to be difficult, but people turn scripture. <laughs> you know, for example, Ephesians five, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. 23 and they say well this is the new Ten Commandments kind of thing and if you know the, the wife doesn't do her part well then the husband has got to do his part if the husband doesn't do his part and in terms of giving his life for his wife the exact way Christ did it and perfectly and everything else then she doesn't even do her part so it's, again it's, it's just turned into a new kind of commandment thing it's into a law again it needs to be done freely with gentleness, peace, love. And that's it right there. Going back to 19, 519. They will submit one to another. It's very simple. That's Thank you, Brother Jason. <laughs> I, I appreciate, appreciate you saying that. It looks like Joanne is back um, actually moving. Her, I can see her video moving out. Yeah, it we need to hear from the woman Joanne, uh, here's an opportunity. If uh, all the t things that we've said up to this point, you, you want to comment on anything, because I know that you had some technical problem. Is there anything you want to say about this now? Um, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic! I'm back on. Um, yeah. Look, um, submission in. Um, I think I've made mention, you know, look, feminists and I suppose others can take that out of context, um, submitting to your husband or submitting to the Lord, you know, like it's um, some sort of burden. Um, in fact, you know, 
submitting to a spiritual head, which would be your husband, um, in the ideal situation, provided that he's a Christian. Um, you know, I think women should feel a, a sense of freedom, liberated in that, because um, you're under uh, the protection of a God, yes, uh, Jesus, yes, um, you know, and your husband, um, who uh, is there to guide you and to, um, you know, to assist you. You're you're a couple. You're working together um, for the Lord um, to, you know, to get to have that relationship with God. Um, you don't. It's not about being, you know, dominated or um, whatever else, you know, people wish to think. Um, I personally don't have that and and I look at other couples that are Christians and I guess I, I envy that um, in a way because, you know, it's very liberating to see um, friends of mine that are Christians and the way that they interact within themselves, but in a godly, under a god, under yeah, under God, as such. Um, I guess that's all. I guess that was my sort of point there. Um, yeah, just the freedom, the freedom in, you know. Be in submitting in to to what God's plan is, God, what God wants. How about submitting to love? <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I said, how about submitting to love? Absolutely. Absolutely, love is um, love is not just you know a word or a feeling. It's um, way beyond that. It's it's a commitment. It's a great many things. Um, you know, there are many ways to love, and submitting to that, I think, is what Jesus was. Uh, was telling us to do. It's not just a physical thing. You know, it's a mental, emotional. It's a brotherly, sisterly. You know, mother, father, etc. Um, love. It, it's a very deep thing, I, I, I think. And submitting to that would be something you know that your heart would be joyous about. Right. That's a good point. Yeah, Something I, I in think our you made a good point about being, being yeah. joyous. Uh, you know, we're also told in yeah. terms of giving, rather than uh, being under some legalistic system of giving, we're told to be a joyful giver. Mm. And it's just this same kind of a principle that uh, serving, serving others, uh, it shouldn't be some legalistic attitude we have about serving. It's that we should have, find joy in serving others. So my question really is, uh, the scriptures say, submit yourselves one to another, and then a few verses later it says, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Uh, so uh, I have a wife, and, and uh, you know, we're legally married, according to the state of Nevada, and uh, we, uh, does, does that mean that uh, um, I and Jesus said, this sets his example of washing the feet of, of others. So am I supposed to wash Bill's feet and Dean's feet and Jason's feet and Joanne's feet? But when it comes to my wife, no, I, I don't wash her feet because she's supposed to always submit to me. Some people, it seems that... They they seem to think their their wife is the is the exception that yeah we're supposed to like serve other people but the wife is always supposed to be submitting to the husband but I think it's reciprocal I think it says submit yourselves one to another and my wife is not the one person in the world that's the exception to the rule I should also be submitting to my wife that means I want to serve her I want to try to put her needs ahead of mine if, if possible 
and then and I want to do it not because uh, some legalistic reason, but just because uh, I, I should love to do it. If if the Holy Spirit is transforming me as as I think it w would, then it's going to give me this attitude of love, like you you said. It's the the law of love, the royal law. Hey, brother Bill, you haven't said anything. What do you got to say about all this? Well, I think I'm I'm in agreement. That's why, you know, I think we have to be very careful with the word submit. You know, submit doesn't mean the Lord over, does it? Submit doesn't, you know, mean a lot of things. Hey, there you go. Come on. And it is, you know, as we say, submission is is in and through love. You know, the love of Christ. You know, it worked perfectly. If every single person submitted to one another, then every single person is equal. There is no one who can lord over. There's no one who can be abased. There's no one who can be exalted. There is an equilibrium there. And I think that's what God desires. And that's what I believe it was in the beginning. And I believe it will be again come the day, you know, we had the new heaven and the new earth. It will be brought back to that. But in regard to the woman submitting to the husband, I think that's in a sense of, you know, that the husband is responsible. So if he has to make hard decisions, you know, and he'll be accountable for those decisions to one degree or another, you know, it is a wise duty to, to come under that submission in that sense. But not in the sense of, you know, she's lower and abased and doesn't deserve her feet washed and has to do the house clean, has to do all this. You know, we have to get the right context. But yeah, submission is a, is a very complex word. And the way I always see it is, you know, it, it's a love and submission to, to, to adhere to, you know, the husband's decision in certain things as the husband has to submit to Christ, you know, in certain things. It, it, it is a, you know, it's, it's very complex. You've really, hit, you've really hit a real hard, deep subject there, but it is getting the word submission in its correct context, which is the, 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 the prime issue here. And it is not a submission as to lord over and to treat another as a doormat. It is literally for for protection, for love, and for guidance. That's what I believe. What about this? What about the wife submitting to the husband's love? What if the husband is to receive love from God and he's to pour out his love on the wife and she's to receive first rather than the husband receiving from the wife first well yeah because that's actually an interesting point <laughs> my wife brings it up sometimes if we ever have a Barney she, she says I've got to submit to me and it says you've got to love me it doesn't say I've got to love you first it says you've got to love me so so you know that is you know there is a valid point in that that, that it is the husband's duty to, to, to show the love of Christ to his wife and then she is to submit in, in, in that love. So there, that is a valid point. I say that because, you know, I had was married for six years and um, 2013 met somebody and didn't talk to her few, too often, but she fell for me. She fell hard. Probably like February of last year. It just all came out, right, to tell me about everything. And I, I said, here's the thing. You're loving me more than I'm able to love you. The, the argument was constantly was, you know, I, I, I love you more than you can love me. And I'm like, well, I think what you need to understand here is that you need to receive the husband's love. And she thought that she could win me over by just giving me that more love. I wasn't going for it at all. So I just kind of throw my little experience, recent experience into it, you know. Hmm. Well, uh, we, can, we can see that you're very lovable. You're almost irresistible. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, Here's a simple uh, nice. you, Some people might think that I'm uh, uh, making a big deal out of a minor thing when it, it simply says uh, uh, she will be a help meet for him. Uh, but I've seen some of these verses uh, abused 
by men that want to, as we said, lord it over their wives and make their wives a doormat. And I don't think that's what uh, uh, how Jesus wants a marriage to be, and, and, and he wants, doesn't want the church to be like that. Uh, all right, let's... Uh, Let's move on to the next part of that verse. It says, uh, And sleep to fall out. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Well, that's a pretty amazing thing, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I'm sure that somebody has something to say about that verse. Well, yeah. yeah. I've, I've got to say it's, it is, it is absolutely wondrous. And, and that ties into what I said in regard to equality. So God created man, and then out of man, woman was created a carbon copy. You know, where we, we was created in the image and likeness of God, it says God mimicked that same thing, you know, within man to create his helper, his helpmate, his woman a carbon copy, but obviously female, of the man. So that's why I always, you know, before the fall, I personally do believe that there was a total equality between man and woman. They was equal. There was carbon copies almost in that sense of each other. And I just I just find that fascinating because he could have made he could have made the woman separate out of another piece of, you know, you know, earth, but he didn't. He made, you know, specifically made the woman out of man. I like the way you say that. Nice one. Good one. Well, um, you know, uh, uh, God could have uh, taken the rib and formed another man to be his helper. But God made a woman instead of a man. And I'm thinking that this woman is anatomically correct to unite with a man. And uh, not only uh, the anatomy for sexual reproduction, but also the brains and the minds are complementary. Uh, I remember there was a magazine article, uh, 1970 or something, on Time magazine, and the headline was, Men and Women Are Different. I mean, like it's a great revelation. They came to they realize men and women are different because it, there was there's a movement in in uh, well, feminism that there's no difference. They're men, are, you know, they're interchangeable, and but they're not. We're not only f obviously physically designed differently, designed in a way to come together and unite, but we're also different in our brains, the way our brains work. And, and the chemistry that's going on in our brains and our bodies are different. And they're different because they're supposed to complement each other. And so, um, but, so that's the thing that I think, I mean, obviously God knew that this fall was going to happen and this, uh, this uh, reproduction in the human race would come about and uh, there'd be a need for uh, the Savior. He knew all that in advance, and he made Eve in a way that she could reproduce with Adam and, and be a perfect match for him. So that's one thing. The other thing that's interesting about this verse is this seems to me like it's like a surgery. I mean, it's, it says he opened him up and took a rib out, and they closed up the wound. I mean, that's, you know, I, I this last year I had three surgeries, and, 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 uh, you know, I I'm, became very familiar with surgery and getting on that surgical table and having them open you up and, you know, and uh, I went to sleep too. Uh, the, the the surgeon put a deep sleep on me like God put on Adam, put me on that table, opened me up and did some things and closed me back up. It this sounds to me like it's describing a surgical procedure. Okay, there it is. Who wants to comment on that? Spiritual surgeon, that's all I can say. <laughs> What's it like? Uh, 
All right, I guess uh, not everybody's as excited about that verse as I am. I, I think there's a lot, uh, a lot in there that's amazing. Uh, and it says in verse 22, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Okay. All right, we're open for discussion on that verse. What I like about that verse is that God brought the woman to man and the man named her. I just find that fascinating. Whether there's any deep spiritual significance, I'm not sure, but I just, like I said, you, you with the surgery, you find that verse fascinating. I find it fascinating that, mm -hmm. that, that God brought the woman to the man and, and, and you know, he was allowed and privileged to name her. I think that's exciting. <laughs> Hmm. Oh, let me see. Yeah, look. Oops. Look. Yeah, go ahead, brother. You know this is cool too. Check this out. Yes. Yeah, it's not like, not like Adam went out to. I mean, we all know how they had internet back then, right? It's not like Adam went out to some dating website or went to the local club, you know, and um. Went out looking for this help me, right? He, God brought her to him, and they came together as one. So there was no striving involved, and it was just nothing but total peace, you know. You mute it again, Luke. <laughs> oh well. I'm a bit, every I'm time a bit I need naughty. Good, every I'm time a I naughty. need a good laugh, <laughs> it just cracks me up. I can't keep remembering to Ooh. unmute myself, but uh, yeah. uh, so the panda man event. Let's put a comma here. A uh, woman equals womb man. W O M B, uh, a man, but uh, like a man, but with a womb. And, and isn't isn't that what she is? She's an inverse copy of man. It's like a man turned inside out, wow. and, and and into a, a, a womb, uh, or or a woman is a man turned inside out. Um, so. Yo, my Cavs game is getting close again. I'll be right back, man. Okay. All right, let's go on to this next verse here. Um, uh, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Um, there's some important things in there that stand out to me. I'll, I'll give you first chance to comment on that. There's some really outstanding words in that verse, I think. Well, usually when people read that there and say they become one flesh, they usually think it's by a baby. But for me, it's spiritually, it's like when a man and a woman know each other as such, they sort of become connected with each other, therefore become one flesh of one another. Hmm. So f you don't think flesh means flesh in that case? Uh, obviously, they're not one flesh in terms of they become uh, it, it, it actually one person. Um, I, I do take it to mean that when they become one flesh, that is a picture of a uh, sexual union between a man and a woman, where they become one, they're united together, 
uh, and the it's that's uh, that's how I see it. I don't I don't see it in a spiritual sense the way you described it, Dean. But um, the other thing in that verse that I think is important is that this is the first time the word wife is mentioned in the scripture, isn't it? I don't remember the word wife coming up before this. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So at this point uh, is, uh, is Eve uh, Adam's wife? Well, obviously, the sexual union is is what makes a man and a wife. In in the context, you know, and I think we kind of think things are done kind of backwards nowadays. I think, you know, in the old days, they were joined together, they became man and wife. And nowadays, in modern terms, you have to go for a, you know a, a rig roll. You've got to register each other, you've got to prepare a, a, a wedding ceremony, you've got to go on and on and on, do so much, you know, have long engagements and stuff. And then you become man and wife when you swap rings. But biblically, in biblical terms, you become man and wife when, when, when you lay with each other, you know each other, and you have that union. So, yeah, that is why it wasn't until he says, you know, basically, let's, let's go back on the verse again. And it says, where obviously they called a woman, and it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It's all in that same sentence, as if the coming together in the flesh, within a sexual union, is the point they become man and wife. That's how I read that. There I go again. Uh, let's look up this verse, uh, cleave unto his wife. I think I know what cleave unto his wife means, and they shall be one flesh. I'd like to see that in some other translations, though. That's uh, Genesis 2.24. Let's see if we can find that in a... Okay. ESV says, um, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Hmm. Okay, uh, um, NIV says, and is, uh, is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Uh, NLT says is joined to his wife and the two are united into one uh, and English standard says hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh NASB says and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh cleave to his wife yeah, there's, bond. There's, yeah. yeah there's a couple of means to cleave obviously this is the most general term for cleave, which doesn't describe this, is is means to, to cut or to split something. But it also means, you know, can describe sticking to something, like glue. So they literally, when they become one flesh, you know, theoretically, you know, for life long, they're supposed to be stuck to each other like glue. So, when, you know, when, when, a, when, when a man leaves his, you know, his mum and dad and that lot and gets married, you know, he's supposed to be stuck like glue to his wife, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. All right, so the, we've got uh, uh, the word wife appearing there for the first time in the scriptures. The very next verse, the word wife appears again. It says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So... Uh, Let's talk about the idea of being a man and a wife, or a husband and a wife. Uh, is there a record? Do you think that you know, Adam and Eve, uh, they certainly didn't have a pastor performing any ceremony, did they? There was nobody else except them and God. 
there's no record in the scriptures uh, of us uh, tell, telling us that there was some kind of a ceremony. Uh, there were there were no signed documents that were authorized by authorized by any government. Uh, it, it's just that they were declared to be man and wife, uh, and it, with this union, they a man will leave uh, a person will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and there. So my point is, uh, it's that's a, that's a long way from what we see in our civilized society today. I don't know how it is other places around the world if it's very really common everywhere to have ceremonies and some official recognition of a marriage but in this case doesn't there, there doesn't seem to be any. Now there's things that happened that are not recorded in the scripture so perhaps there was some formal kind of a ceremony. I know in, in Judaism they had formal ceremonies but Judaism is a legalistic thing that uh, we don't want to we don't certainly want to copy, uh, but my I'm wondering today is uh, is it a marriage today? You think if two Christian believers uh, decide that they want to be husband and wife, promise to each other that they're going to be husband and wife and before God, is that satisfactory? Uh, or do you think that we need to follow the laws of the state? And uh, go get, go go pay for the permit and go through the uh, the the actual ceremony. I mean, uh, I I've gone through the legal ceremony, and uh, but the main value I see in it is that you know my wife and I have benefits because because it's a legal marriage. The state provides certain benefits to people who are married, and uh, if we didn't have that legal marriage. We probably we wouldn't be entitled to certain benefits, but uh, other than that, uh, I, is there any reason would would two people who declare that they're married would that be a actual marriage if if they did that and uh, took a vow to God? I believe so. Yeah, absolutely. And some countries don't even have licenses or certificates. I actually have a good uh, video on my channel about um, what's it called? It said uh, marriage licenses. So it's called marriage from the state or from God. It, it I just broke it down. Where this whole license thing came from? Certificates. How the uh, you know the church the Catholics want to keep it clear that they got their people, their members. They can't go to the Protestants, and then of course you got the blacks being able to go to their their, their slave masters to get a uh, piece of paper to get permission to get married, and then of course they they'll go to the states eventually. A black one to get married to a white. <laughs> it's a big money mess, man. But yeah, these states they want to act, or the churches, of course, too. They want to act as though they are God. It's really so. I I wonder if uh, we. Uh, we have a congregation here. Uh, the, the, what we have going on right now is church. We have Jesus said, "Where two or three are gathered together in, in my name, there I, I am in the midst of them." And there's five of us congregated together to, talking about Jesus and scriptures. And so, uh, if this is a congregation, what if someone was in our congregation now, and uh, they didn't get that? Document from the state. Would we, we uh, would we accept that as a as an acceptable marriage, or would we would we say that there's something wrong here? Uh, you can't be part of the congregation because there's certain types of behavior where uh, the the believers are cast out of the congregation. Yes. Not for about an hour. Okay. Thanks. See how my wife offered me dinner there. And I, and I said not in about an hour. She said, you're okay. Being, you're being very submissive there, Luke. Good job, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> no, he said, I was being submissive to you, honey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she heard that through the...
the door. She said, no, I'm not. Uh, okay, so if you can recall, uh, like I said, said, someone joins this congregation. Uh, what are we to do? What if I discovered that Bill and his wife didn't get some legal document in England, and, and, but they were like living in sin, as, as uh, some people would, would call it? What, 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 would, what are we to do? In whose eyes? Wow, you said right there, no, Joanne. In, in whose eyes? In whose eyes? Is it, you know, uh, the piece of paper that you... Um, I don't know what happens in other countries, but here in Australia, when you get married, you can uh, do it one or two ways. You can go to the court, um, or you can have a church wedding, um, you know, where a pastor obviously presides over it, but on top of that you have to still get um, a legal document on top of that because it's not recognised as a marriage, just a church, uh, you know, like the pastors, you know, with the certificate of the pastor of the church is not recognised in the eyes of the government here. You actually have to do a second paper, uh, legal paper that says, and then uh, sign that and then that gets sent in and then you'll get a marriage certificate from the like you know from the government, basically. So I just say in whose eyes, uh, in in the eyes of the government or in the eyes of God. The, the paperwork is always in, in the eyes of the government for sure, isn't it? You know. You know, but still we ha we still live in society, so we still have to abide by the rules and the law of the land. And, you know, Jesus said to, you know, um, surrender to Caesar what is Caesar's. And I know that is one of many things that we have to do by law to live in the, in the society that we do. But in, in a spiritual sense, in whose eyes? You know, if God, if, if God can give Eve unto Adam then who are we to then say you need a piece of paper to say that you're married? Exactly. Not, not only that, though, but it's across the board. All, all the marriages in the Bible, there's, I mean, Abraham picked up Sarah, you know, and obviously Mary and Joseph, you know. But uh, I'm going to go back to this issue with government. Okay, thirteenth <laughs> chapter of Romans is pretty strong on this. Uh, God did not ordain the United States of America to allow the slaughter of four thousand defenseless innocent children every day. Yet most churches in this country proclaim that the thirteenth chapter of Romans clearly says that God ordained our government to have the laws it has. I promise you, it did not. Uh, be broken down that way by God. He didn't predestine anything for knowledge. Well, he did for He had for knowledge, but he didn't, you know, predestine it so that um, God would be killing or allowing it to slaughter of defenseless innocent children by the means of uh, barbaric abortions. Uh, obviously, there's other ways that people can commit crimes and all that. But here's the thing: we have what we have in Scripture. You look at uh, beloved. For example, Jesus says, render to Caesar what is Caesar, render to God what is God's. I'm telling you right now, folks, God, his throne is in heaven, earth is his footstool, he dwells in us men and women. Okay, <laughs> Check this out. When it says that we're going to render to Caesar what is Caesar, well, we do that, we're going to be under his kingdom. We don't have to render anything to Caesar. In fact, when we render unto God, Caesar will be where Caesar's supposed to be, the tail. I wrote a book about that, and it's in the process of being published with regard to breaking down the government. People are so scared, especially Christians, of government. Thinking God's using government to do this, doing that. <laughs> You're going to be set free. Wow, it's awesome. And you can. Uh, what is the location of your uh, encampment where your your cult is uh, head headquarters? Somewhere in Ohio, isn't it? The what? 
<laughs> that was a, my attempt at humor, brother. Uh, uh, because there are there are people that uh, that don't want to be under the government at all, and they form their own little local governments. And and uh, I, I've know I know people like that that are totally against uh, uh, being under the United States government. Uh, okay, so uh, let's uh, say hi to brother Stephen. Go ahead. The government's supposed to be under us. That's all there is to it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and in, in this case, in the United States, that's the way it's supposed to be, but um, uh, I, I don't want to get sidetracked into a, a lot of politics right now, but uh, uh, let's, say, let's say hi to Brother Stephen, who just joined us. Stephen, hi, glad you could make it. Hi, uh, Brother uh, Luke, how are you this evening? Can yeah, you we're doing really well. We're having a very interesting discussion here. So, uh, we're, we're, have you been listening at all? Do you have any idea what we're talking about? I guess by some of the conversation I just listened to you talking about marriage, am I correct? Yeah, uh, we're talking about the idea that uh, the first verses that should say wife uh, is when Adam and Eve is talking about. Uh, uh, coming together and cleaving to each other, and it calls what Eve wife for the first time. And the question is, uh, if we've, Eve is declared to be the wife at that point, um, uh, can can we today uh, accept that uh, there is a an acceptable marriage, even though someone didn't bother getting the paperwork done with the you know their, whatever their government is. Yeah, I believe that God anoints marriage, clearly states that in the Bible. It's uh, one of these uh, things that he has described to man, one of the, you know, that he should uh, leave his mother and father, that he may be joined with a woman in holy matrimony, um, and therefore it is one of God's covenants with man. Um, the legal side of it is a completely different thing, what the state requires um, you to have, uh, and not necessarily something that God requires you to have a license, I assume that's what you're referring to, um, then, you know, that's something the state requires, but it's not what God requires. God just simply states that that's a covenant that he has made with man. Because um, if you look at some of the religions, like the Church of England over here in the UK, for example, uh, they won't marry uh, divorced people, for argument's sake, um, and that they don't recognize divorced people for whatever reason because they consider that, uh, you know, they don't, they don't wow. do that. And also, I believe that's a position the Catholics also take. So I think God anoints marriage, um, and I believe, you know, that uh, it is a covenant that he makes, and I think that in today's society, it's one of these, one of these things that, Man has used and blown out of all proportion, brother Luke, and turned it around to their own benefit. Luke, isn't that amazing that they they can't even get remarried in England? Isn't that amazing? Well, I know that the the Catholic Church uh, has uh, always uh, forbidden uh, remarriage. Uh, and if you get if you get divorced, you can't get remarried. So what they do is they annul the divorce. They annul the marriage, and annulment means that it never happened. That way they can declare that you were never married, therefore uh, it's acceptable for the, you to get married. So it's just kind of a, a technicality, a way that they get around it. But, but even their government, it sounds like they won't even allow a um, person to get married a multiple, another time. I'd like, to get, I'd like to get back to the point Joanne made. She said, she asked the question, in whose eyes? Uh, in other words, it, we're asking this: Is it a marriage if they if they uh, uh, like make a promise to each other that they're married and and uh, and before God, and yet they don't go to the courthouse and get a, make it legal by the state? Um, would we accept it in this congregation? And Joanne says, "Well, is it a marriage in whose eyes? Well, is it is it our position? Is it our role?" As a congregation right now, there's only a few people, but let's suppose we had a hundred people or a thousand people, and people recognize this generally as a this is a church congregation. Does that congregation 
does does it have the right and the duty at all to examine this kind of a thing and make that kind of a judgment? Um, it, because Joanne says, in whose eyes? And uh, are we supposed to make those kinds of judgments? Uh, if scripture tells us, uh, I think, uh, we're not supposed to judge the, the lost world. God judges them. We're, but we are supposed to judge the, the brethren within the body, within the congregation. We're supposed to make these kinds of judgments. And Paul criticized one of the churches because they weren't doing it. They were not being responsible and making the, the judgments like this kind. And there's other things. Like if someone was doing some blatant type of uh, sinful act, like I think the example given in the scriptures is that someone was sleeping with his father's wife or something, or stepmother's, and he had to be cast out. So um, do you think it's, it would be our place to make that kind of judgment? And if it is, uh, would we judge that someone who is shacked up, as, we, as the world calls it, being shacked up, uh, are we, we, should we make the judgment that that's an acceptable marriage? Uh, they didn't make it legal in the state, but they made a commitment before God. I think, I think the issue in, in the way in Corinth, the, the main issue was that obviously this bloke was sleeping basically with, with his mum, whether it was his uh, stepmom or biological mum. That, 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 that's irrelevant because obviously his father was married to this woman. So that would have been adultery. You know, but if, if obviously this woman was single and obviously wasn't married to anyone at the time and he obviously knew her, you know, he became one flesh with her, then, then I suppose in that situation that, 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 that God allows her. <clears throat> you know, because the certificate at the end of the day the certificate doesn't consummate anything. You know, when we get saved, we don't have a, you know, I know some churches have a baptismal certificate or have a certificate for the day that you, you give yourself, you know, Lord to the Lord, etc. That's not what consummated salvation. Faith in Christ consummated the salvation. And it's the same with marriage. When, when, when a man and a woman come together as one flesh and know each other, in God, God's eyes, that is what consummates the marriage. And, and so long as, you know, either at the time uh, are not married to another, then, then I see that as legitimate, personally. Okay. Uh, any dissenting um, opinions on this? Or are we, we all in agreement that, that uh, you know, a, a state, uh, state approval certification is not, not necessary? Uh, for us to for us to accept it as a marriage, um, and and then the question is, um, the other part of the question is, uh, what kind of judgments is a congregation expected to make? Uh, personally, that's always been difficult for me. I, I had a home church for seven years at my house, and uh, I've uh, I never felt really com comfortable about confronting people when I knew that they were. Uh, doing things that uh, they shouldn't be doing, uh, and but are are we supposed to do that? And and uh, are, would you be comfortable with it? Because for me, it, it's that's been like the difficult thing of uh, being part of a congregation is when you uh, obviously uh, it doesn't affect their salvation, but are are we supposed to still continue to stand against uh, you know uh, this? Uh, uh, I'll say a ch person chooses to practice some kind of activity that we know that uh, God doesn't want them to do, and, and are we supposed to take a stand against it or just say, uh, all their sins are forgiven and it's not my business? That... Like Joanne said, you know, how do we know God said it's not right to follow the government's? headship on that rather than God's headship? Who says it's a sin? Well, I, yeah, yeah, I wasn't talking about uh, this question of marriage. We've already discussed it. Uh, we, we, I think we all agree that it wouldn't be necessary for someone to uh, get married by the state if, they, if their marriage it was a commitment of, that they're going to be a, a married couple for life. They made that commitment. Right, okay. 
uh, and I think we probably all accept that. But there's other things, there's other types of behavior, like the behavior that we cited earlier that Paul condemned. Um, uh, I've, found, I've always found it very hard to confront that type of Yeah, thing. look, I'm with you, buddy. I'm, I'm never, totally with you, man. Yeah. Weakened, I've never had the strength to kind of stand up against it. When I've seen people living in a particular way, I didn't want, you know how it says, first you confront the person, and then you come with two or three right, witnesses, yeah, yeah. and then you bring them before the congregation. And that's what happened, and then finally that person was cast out and turned over to the devil, remember? So how comfortable are you with doing that kind of a process? Um, I think it depends, Brother Luke, to be honest with you, and whether you feel that uh, God is putting that on your heart to do that. Um, I've had help in the past. Uh, I need, needed a certain time, and I was very thankful for... Uh, the people that helped me at that time came forward and, and took that step to help me out of a situation that I found myself into. Um, I think it does depend, but the Bible does say that we should um, advise uh, one another if we are doing something that we shouldn't. And it is difficult at times uh, whether we should do that or not. But there are it clearly states in the Bible that if we see a brother or sister that are, is doing something we shouldn't, we should. Uh, I don't know exactly where it is. Maybe Bill could tell me exactly where that is in the Bible. But I know that it says that uh, you should you should uh, guide or advise your brother and sister in Christ when they are doing something wrong and help them steer them back on the right direction. That that is extremely difficult to do and I think it's something that God has to put on your heart in the first place. That's what I would say on this issue. Yeah, I think we we were you trying to describe uh, two Timothy four two I wonder there where where you know it obviously it's speaking to save people but it tells you to, to preach the word be in season in season out of season reprove Rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Was yeah, that the first? It was, you know. Yeah, it sounds like it, Bill. I mean, to be honest with you, mate, I don't have my Bible right to hand at this second because obviously I just popped in very quickly to say hi and thank you all very much for your recent support during my tragic circumstances. But I just wanted, uh, you know, I just wanted to. That may well be the verse. I just wanted to, uh, you know, say that's what I felt on this subject. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, there are legitimate grounds, as we just decided, you know, that if we see, you know, a brother or sister in sin, you know, and we're obviously we're talking as a sin within 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 the a sexual nature at the moment, that, that that we need to confront them. And and I think I'm I'm probably a little bit like Luke in that situation, that that I find it very very hard to confront people. You know, face to face with issues like that, it takes me a lot longer. But I'm sure, you know, with any congregation, whether it's online or in a church or in a, in, in, a, in a house group, that God has, you know, would appoint someone, I believe, you know, with the boldness to deal with that situation. Yeah, it to me, uh, uh, confronting someone and then bringing two other believers to confront them together and then before the congregation putting them on trial and and then casting them out of the congregation that's something that uh, I've never actually done even though I've I've thought that maybe there's situations where it was pro the situation called for it I didn't do it and and uh, however what I've always been very very comfortable with is casting someone out of a congregation or fellowship on the grounds of, of uh, not uh, holding to the core doctrines of Christianity. So if, if someone here started teaching and arguing that Jesus is a created being, he's the son of God, but he's not eternal, you know, then I, that would be, if we couldn't change their mind, and then, then that would be grounds for just fellowship, casting them out. But if someone here was you know, fornicating or committing adultery or doing something uh, or uh, just abusing their life with alcoholism and drugs and, and uh, or stealing or embezzlement or anything. Obviously, 
uh, these things are shouldn't be done. But I've I've never felt really uh, called or, or, or compelled. Uh, I actually felt guilty about permitting things to go on without confronting them. So I don't know if you guys have had these kinds of experiences, but for when it comes to core doctrines, I you know it's always been easy for me to confront someone and 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 separate from them. How about you guys? I, I think like I said I, I think I'm the same as you, Luke. I think, you know, and, and I see it as a, a weakness personally on my behalf that, that I'm not bold enough at times to confront people on, on certain issues. But again, when it comes to, to heresy, rank heresy, and damnable heresy, you know, I'm quite bold in regard to that. So <laughs> maybe, maybe, it's, <clears throat> maybe it's, you know, a specific person at a specific time for a, a specific reason scenario, perhaps. All right, unless somebody else has to, and wants to add on that, I'm going to go on to another Yeah, race. I got something. I used to be really rough with this back when I was like a mixture, you know, grace and law, up until really 2012, 2013, when I came all the way over to grace. I would, before then, I was just rough with people. I found that little thing with somebody, I'd jump all over them, man. And now it's like, I, I don't need to see them anymore. As having its spot on them, I see them as the righteousness of God. I just trust that the Lord's going to clean them up, you know, whatever case, whatever it might be. Yeah. Okay, brother. Yeah. So, uh, I don't think any of us are are customarily or normally take that kind of a viewpoint where we confront people on that. We we know that. Uh, Everybody's a work in progress uh, as far as how we're being transformed by the Holy Spirit. And some people seem to live lives that are uh, clearly, uh, uh, God, I know God would not approve, but uh, we, we just, I, I give them the grace of, of saying that the Holy Spirit will correct them. That's not for me to do it. So maybe it is a weakness. I've always felt a little conflicted and, and, uh, and uh, guilty about that. All right, we'll go on to the next verse. Uh, verse starting chapter 3 now. Uh, now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Okay, we'll stop there. Yeah, that, that's an interesting one. and I did touch on it a little bit last week, and I even involved Lordship Salvation. Because when God spoke to God spoke to Adam, you know he was commanded not to eat of it. Well, obviously, as he passed his message on to Eve, she then says, "Well, God says I can't touch of it or eat of it." So something was put in in there. So as soon as she touched it, straight away, because obviously some other law was injected by Adam, she touched the apple, didn't die, and said, "Oh." God's obviously a liar than Adam. Where if, 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 if Adam would have stepped exactly to what God said, you're not to eat of it, then that might have been a completely different scenario. But as typical lordship salvation, adding things in, in, in the way, you know, and complicating things when they need to be. You know, just not to eat it. She touched it because Adam relayed that, well, if you even touch it, you're going to die. She didn't die. Then, by assumption, she, she you know, assumed that God lied to her because she was still alive. Then she just ate it. Yeah, I think that's a very, very uh, interesting point. Um, she added. She added to what God said. And therefore misrepresented God and actually placed more demands than, than God God's demand. So, uh, we see that happening all the time. Uh, God says, 
believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and, and people add to that and say, repent of your sins and believe on Jesus. And so that's the kind of thing I think Bill is referring to that he sees in that verse, and it's a valid point. Uh, if, if anybody wants to comment on that, uh, I have something else that I want to bring up, but anybody want to elaborate any further on that point? Okay, uh, let me ask you, uh, Sister Joanne. Let me, okay, thank you. Sister Joanne, do you have any pets in your house? Cats, dogs, or pets? Yeah, a dog. A do your dog. Uh, does your dog uh, speak to you? No. He's never spoken to you? Oh. I suppose I think he has, but no, he hasn't. <laughs> Well, I mean, he, he communicates you with his expressions and his and his behavior. You, he, there's a form of communication, but he's not verbally speaking words to you, is he? No, definitely not. How would you react? How would you react if you woke up tomorrow morning and your dog actually was speaking verbally to you? I think I'd fall over and faint. <laughs> You, but but isn't that because it's not normal for your dog to be speaking? If your dog oh, was speaking true. to you for, for years now, you would accept it that this dog speaks, or let's say all of our pets speak to us verbally. Mm. But but uh, since it's not the norm, you would react and be shocked and amazed that your dog is speaking, right? Definitely. So what stands out to me is... The serpent is speaking to Eve. Mm. I don't see any reaction from Eve that, wow, how is this possible? How is a serpent speaking to me? Animals don't talk, but she's not expressing any shock or dismay or surprise, is she? Yeah, I, I've often um, wondered... In regards to that, with within the Garden of Eden, um, you know, the conditions and back then and um, the the perfection of what God had created at that time. Um, would I don't know whether they would have thought any different of it um, A at that point they hadn't um, eaten yet of the apple of knowledge for a start so would they have known any different Um, is, is anybody else uh, see this as a um, um, amazing amazing thing? I mean, uh, to me, the normal reaction, if a snake started talking to me, I'd be shocked and amazed. And how is it possible that you can talk? I mean, I wonder what's going on. That we don't get that kind of reaction from Eve. So what kind of conclusion can we can we can we make from the, from the Eve's lack of a reaction? Anybody? Well, we we can conclude one or two things. One that before the fall and creation was 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 tainted, perhaps the creatures did speak to us. You know, there could be a possibility they actually did speak to them and it was normal. And, and the other scenario would be, obviously, because later on in that, in that same chapter, you know, when, when they was blaming each other, you know, Adam, bl Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the serpent, it describes that the serpent beguiled her, as if this serpent may have had a, a additional, you know, powers beyond the other creatures. And did because to beguile was to put a spell on, is to be spellbound. So it can only surely be one of them two scenarios. Uh, 
Uh, the, the verse I read, it, it, it does say, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. More subtle. Um, to me, subtle uh, doesn't mean that he had more intelligence, more uh, ability. He was highly advanced and, and uh, uh, had much more uh, intellect and even the ability to speak verbally. Uh, he was superior in that way. It, I don't think the word subtle means that. Now, maybe in some other translation, they don't they have some other word besides subtle that would be um, would uh, fit this better. But if 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 it if it really means that he was subtle, that just means that he's not blatant. It's it's a little bit deceptive, you know. He, it's not so clear cut what he's trying to do. He's subtle about it. Uh, so um, we might think that this this serpent is an exception to everybody else, and in, in he's speaking. But I don't think being subtle me, it, it tells me that. So I think that there is a possibility that it was normal for the, some kind of communication between man and the animals at that point in time. Because of the lack of surprise from from uh, Eve in this conversation. Um, now uh, it says we, it says, um, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Uh, now the serpent goes on to say. And the serpent said unto the woman, Yea, ye shall not surely die. Okay, now what's, what is the, stands out to you right there? Well, <laughs> Satan shows himself of what he is, a liar from the beginning. Yeah, uh, Satan contradicts God. God told them they will surely die. Satan says, nope, you won't die. He's absolutely contradicting what God says. He's calling God a liar. He's declaring the exact opposite of what God said. And therefore, Eve is in a situation where she has to decide, is she going to believe God or is she going to believe Satan? Now, I felt that the, uh, uh, it's, it's very common that people think that the original sin was disobeying God and eating the fruit. But uh, to me, the original sin happened before the act of disobedience. The original sin was believing Satan and not believing God. And that's, to me, the sin of unbelief uh, is the issue then and now. It's, it's the whole issue uh, of mankind has always faced. Will we believe God? If we want salvation, that's all we got to do is believe Jesus is our Savior. He's our Savior. God, trust him. Believe him. Trust him. Uh, don't don't believe what the Pope's telling you. Don't believe what Muhammad's telling you. Don't believe uh, any of these uh, other philosophies or religions. Instead, believe God. We still have a choice what we're going to believe, if we believe God or not. Eve was put in this position for the very first time in history. Will she believe God, or will she believe the devil? And to me, that's the that's the fall. The fall happened before the apple, in my opinion. The fall happened when she believed the devil and thought God was the liar and the devil was true. Anybody want to respond to that? I suppose in, in one sense, you're right. The, the fall did begin the moment that, that in the heart, you know, the, the woman perceived the lie and took, you know, the, the, the serpent's word over God's will. So I suppose in that sense, 
the fall had begun within within mankind's heart. But obviously, it was manifested, as we know, at, at the actual eating of the apple. You know, who, Lord, only God knows whether at that point, you know, if she touched the apple and thought, "No stuff for this, I'm dropping it." That then, then the fall may not be manifested, and they might have just got a little chasten or something. But yeah, you know, the fall did initially, in the heart sense, in a spiritual sense, begin the moment she doubted God. And believe the lie of the devil. You're muted again. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Every time, every time you say I'm muted again, and I I, I end up laughing. You see it. it who was it who was talking about smiling and laughing in a video recently or something? Uh, and I, I was making the point that uh, it's true that when we smile, that uh, uh, endomorphins in our brain are it's secreted, and we feel elation. In fact, they did a study and found out that. Uh, if if right if I smile right now and I I'm not smiling because I just instinctively smile because I got happy, but I'm smiling I'm forcing myself because I'm making the corners of my mouth go up. As soon as I do that, when my facial muscles move up, my brain thinks I'm smiling and therefore my brain shoots off into morphins and therefore I get happy, and then the smile becomes a real smile, and I'm so. Um, I don't. Uh, this is crazy tangent I go off on, but uh, every every time I don't mute, and Bill says you're muted, brother. <laughs> it just makes me smile, and laugh again, and I get all, all giddy and happy from it. But I'm not doing it on purpose. Uh, all right, what, what I was trying to say is that this is a good time to stop uh, because of the time and because of the the the, the, the subject. Uh, and I always want to have a few minutes saved in the end so that uh, if someone's watching this and uh, they're not what I call a Christian, um, we want to tell them how they can become a Christian and, and why. Why, you, why should you become a Christian? Uh, they, they might find this study on Adam and Eve that was you know, interesting, but now they're, now they're wondering about Christianity and why should you become a Christian? What is a Christian? What do you have to do to be a Christian? Uh, I'll, I'll ask Brother Bill to start talking about that, and we'll have everybody put their two cents worth in. Brother Bill? I'll even put a camera on for this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To be a Christian it is one of the most simplest things in the world to be, yet also one of the hardest things. And by that I mean it is to be a Christian is to abandon your own efforts to get to heaven, to abandon your own efforts to be reconciled to God, and abandon all your efforts to have eternal life. Right? That's, that is the hardest thing in the world, especially if you, 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 you're full of pride. But it is also the easiest thing on earth, you know, because it's so simple. The gospel really is so simple. that simply just to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And to believe on Christ is to just put your trust and faith in him. Or in layman's terms, put all your eggs in one basket. You know, don't keep some out thinking that you can you know, use them late and try and save yourself. No, you put every single egg in that basket and that basket is representative of Jesus Christ. So simple to do, yet so hard. So I would implore anyone watching, you know, this this hangout this evening, you know, if you if you're if you're thinking about becoming a Christian and, and you want an assurance of that, that when you pass from this life to the next, you'll be in glory and you'll be with many brothers and sisters and you'll see Christ you know, face to face. If you want to do that this day, just simply believe these facts, that, that Jesus Christ loves you so much, that he died for all your sins, that he was buried for you and that he rose again the third day to proof that he had power over death. And he can not only resurrect himself, but he'll resurrect every single creature that trusts in him. 
everyone who puts their eggs in that one basket trusts him alone and those facts will go to heaven. So I pray that, that you would just do that. Just simply believe on Christ and become a son or daughter of the living God. Amen. Amen. Amen, brother. Well, I, I don't think of being diligent. Uh, like, oh, Bill didn't tell them enough. You know, he needs to give them more information. They don't, that's not enough. Even though it's simple, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Uh, as you said, believing on Jesus just just means that you're you're relying on Him completely instead of trying to get to heaven on your through your own effort. You're depending on Him. That's why I call it Christian, because a Christian is just someone that's relying on Christ instead of themselves. So um, you you certainly couldn't be accused of being negligent and leaving out important facts. Um, we we know that. Uh, uh, well, well, there's one thing that maybe you didn't do, you didn't mention. I'll ask anybody who wants to to comment on this. Could you tell me just a little bit about who Jesus is, so there's no confusion over that? I could do that if no one else wants to. <laughs> yeah, Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. He is God incarnate, and 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 only God has the power to forgive sins and to give life. So this is why it's so important you recognize who Jesus Christ is in a sense, that he is God. You know, and when he says something and he promises something, you know, it, it, it will come to pass. You know, the word even says that, that God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent, which is to change his mind. So if he says he's God and the whole scriptures declare that he is God and has the power to forgive sins, and has the power to raise you from the dead, then that, that is the reason you believe on this Jesus Christ. Not another Jesus, because there are many, and Luke made the valid point, there are many false Jesus, but there is only one true Jesus Christ, and that is God himself manifest in the flesh. Believe on this Jesus and live. Amen. You know, as, as much as I love all of our studies, uh, uh, whether all the various topics that that we've discussed over the last couple of years in these hangouts, and now doing this topical study on Adam and Eve, it's it's I just love the, discussing it. But the highlight for me is always the last few minutes when we get to tell people about Jesus and salvation. Uh, so now, if you're the viewing audience, uh, you know who Jesus is. You know what he did for you. And you know what he's offering you. So now it's in your hands. I was discussing with Bill before we started the show that, uh, you know, uh, as Christians, um, you know, uh, the scriptures tell us that we're supposed to uh, tell people this good news that Jesus is God and he died for your sins and he raised himself from the dead and proving he has the power of life and death and he's offering you life everlasting as a free gift. If you'll just believe in him, he'll give it to you. And this is good news. It's so, so such good news that sometimes people think it's too good to be true, but it is true. That's what biblical Christianity is. So uh, when we get to this point where we get to tell people the good news, that's the happiest part of the, sh the, the discussion. And But it's, it's only our responsibility as believers to tell you the good news. Uh, but none of us have the power to, to make you believe it and receive it. It's up to you. Now you know the truth, and it's up to you. Between you and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God is drawing you to Jesus right now, and I hope you'll respond and come to Jesus and receive the gift of eternal life. Uh, that's it. Uh, unless anybody in the panel has uh, anything else they want to say before we close, we'll close the show. Anyone? Okay, uh, thank you panelists for participating. Uh, well, I'll close the live broadcast and then we can talk privately for a while. But uh, thank you for participating and uh, I pray that everyone who's put their faith in Jesus uh, that you can learn to rest. Rest in his arms, 
Rest in his love and grace. And praise Jesus, our great Savior God. Amen.